morning. We continue today with our series on 1 Peter, titled Wayfaring Strangers. The Apostle Peter, once again here, is addressing suffering for Christ. We have seen over the last uh, couple of months that we as believers and following God's commands, those whose home and eternity uh, is not in this land, but in heaven, we will quite likely face trials and troubles. And the fact that we are Christians will not make us immune to these sufferings, but actually, it may increase the chance of them. However, with our eyes fixed tightly on Jesus Christ, we can not only overcome and thrive and grow in these hard times. In a perfect world, those who have placed their trust in God would not face troubles. However, we live in a sin-filled world. And as we have discussed many times, the world, Satan, and even some of our friends and families, they don't like the new us as Christians. So troubles come our way, and Peter is encouraging us and preparing us and giving us ways not only to get through the tough times, but to also experience spiritual growth in our own lives. It will also let the unbelieving world to see Christ in our actions and how we live and our responses. If you would, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4 and follow with me as I read in its entirety uh, verses 12 through 19. And then we'll try to come back and break these down and see how these apply to our lives. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through as if something strange was happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his sufferings so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed. For the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news. And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your life to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. Verse 12, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. The NLT version uses the words, dear friends. The King James says, beloved. Peter, Peter is clearly talking to believers here, wayfaring strangers, and he's offering hope. He's offering hope to those who know Christ. Without Christ, there can be no hope. He says, don't be surprised at the fiery trials. Now, I'm sure that when Peter uh, says fiery trials, he's talking about way above and beyond just getting, you know, unfriended or talking about. At the time Peter is writing this, Nero was actively killing Christians 
for their faith, even making lamps or candles out of them. So Peter says, hey guys, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised by these bad things. And then in verse 13, he says, instead, be very glad. For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Instead, when the worst of the worst is happening and there seems to be no hope, when the report from the doctor comes back and it's not good, when the woman or man you love leaves without reason, when you experience sickness, fiery trials, Peter calls them, big stuff, be very glad. Do what? You know, the world, yes, you have got to be kidding. Our human minds say, really, God? Really? Be glad. <laughs> be glad because Christ suffered as well. And when you suffer for him, you will be blessed. A question that is asked often by believers of all levels of maturity is why, God? I'm trying to do right. Why, God? Listen, listen to me. This is reality. God allows us free will. He allows his children to sin and he allows his children to suffer the consequences of their sins. And he does this for a variety of reasons. First, he does this to expose our sinful hearts. Trials and troubles should make us shine a light on ourselves to see if we're truly living as Christians and if not, help us make the changes that are needed. Consequences help get us right. Next, we sometimes are allowed to suffer to turn us from our sins. Once again, consequences are often the best medicine. And when we learn from our mistakes, we often don't make the same mistakes over and over again. Here's one that we don't expect. We're allowed to suffer sometimes to prepare us for more suffering. It has been said that a Christian is always either in a wreck, coming out of a wreck, or headed for a wreck. You know, when we have overcome prior trials, God is preparing us for the next ones. I think this is the most important one. He allows us to sin and suffer the consequences of that sin to cause us to turn to him and focus completely and totally on him. You know, when we focus on God, we stop focusing on self and we allow him to drive instead of continuing to make a mess out of our own lives. Trials are common for all people, Christians included. Trials come in many, many forms. Trials can do and put our faith to the test. Without trials, there would be no spiritual growth. Peter in this passage is talking about major trials, fiery trials, trials on steroids. He says these kinds of trials often cause panic and doubt. But when we, are, when we arm ourselves with the same attitude as Christ, they should produce trust. So let's break all this fiery trial stuff down and see just what God, through Peter, wants us to learn from them. Verses 12 and 13 shows us how we should react to major trials. Verse 12, don't be surprised. <clears throat> Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Think, think about it. Peter, Paul, James, Jude, as well as others, they experienced trials and taught about them as well. All of the apostles, except for John, died for their faith. What all these great men of the Bible are saying is simply, don't be blindsided by trials, expect them. Verse 13 says, keep on rejoicing 
Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Praise God when the tough times come. Praise God, never stop rejoicing that you have been delivered, that you have been redeemed, that you have been saved. Praise God that Satan sees you as a force to be reckoned with. When we don't get blindsided and we rejoice in all things, these reactions, brethren, will help build a deeper relationship with Christ and will bring greater rewards in this life and the next. These are reactions of believers to major trials. Then Peter, Peter says that we are to remember a few things in those trials. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed. For the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. First, trials give us an opportunity to pull on God's power and strength instead of relying on our own. The proper response lets others see his power and strength as well. Next, as much as we want to deny it, sometimes suffering is deserved. Verse 15, if you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. Peter simply says that if you're suffering for doing the wrong stuff, you're getting what you deserve, reaping what we sow. Then he says, remember, it is no shame to suffer for Christ. Verse 16, but it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. Consider it pure joy, James says, hold your head high. It is our privilege to suffer for the one who suffered for us. And we should praise God for the privilege of being his child. The next one, though, is hard. Verse 17, the first part. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. Sometimes suffering is needed. We are human beings and human sin. And that's why we ask for forgiveness for our sins. We know that the blood of our Savior covered our past, present, and future sins. When we are baptized, we are truly forgiven, and his blood continues to cleanse our sins as we follow his commands. Trials are helping in our spiritual growth. The trials we suffer as Christians will pale, brethren, in comparison to the ones the unbelieving world will face in eternity. Verse 17 and 18, the latter part of verse 17 and 18, and if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news. And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? Let me just try to put this in very simple terms. Brethren, there is nothing. There is nothing that this old world can throw at you and me to make a dent in the suffering of those who choose to spend eternity apart from God. But even in this life, our suffering will not be as bad as theirs because we have hope. Imagine trying to get through a major illness or one of the thousand other trials and troubles and hardships that can happen without God. Can you imagine going through a real tough illness or, or even someone in your home or family passing away without God. You see, Christians have hope. We have assurance of the coming peace. And we have the knowledge at the end of the day or the end of this life, there is God waiting to wrap us in his loving arms forever. The lost don't have assurance. They don't have hope. They don't have the vision of being held by God. So I can't imagine how they deal with troubles. Peter tells us in this passage how to react to trials, what to remember in the trial. 
Then he closes out this chapter with what I believe is the key. He tells us who to rely on in trials. Verse 19. So if you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to God who created you, for he will never fail you. If you're suffering for Christ, keep doing what you're doing. It's working. And I can tell you, Satan's not happy. And trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. The world, the word trust is translated in trust. In other versions, and it means commit. In the same word used in Luke 23, when Jesus said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Complete, complete, and total trust. In God alone, we place our trust, and nothing, nothing can stand against us. You know that trials, troubles, hardships, they all cause pressure. And pressure can increase strength or it can destroy. Hudson Taylor, someone who understood trials and pressure, was a missionary to China in the 1800s. And he was there for over 51 years. And he said these words, It doesn't matter how great the pressure is. What really matters is where the pressure lies. Whether it comes between me and God or whether it presses me nearer God's heart. So what now? What now? How do we apply this? How do you and I respond to trials with the attitude of Christ? For us, trials should draw us closer to God. The unbelievers resist, resent, and even cave in under the weight of trials. Brethren, we don't have to. We serve a God who can and who will. And God will never waste a hurt or a trial. When we give him the glory, he can and will turn the bad to good, the sorrow to joy. Don't be surprised by these trials. Don't stop rejoicing. Use trials to lean on God and his power and his strength. So then as learning tools at least use them as learning tools and make sure that we don't deserve what we're getting if we do deserve what we're getting make changes don't continue on make changes that are necessary in our lives there's no shame no shame in suffering for christ <coughs> nothing we get will compare to the suffering of those who do not know jesus if you don't remember all of the things in today's lesson, please remember this, just this one thing. When trials come, you can rely on God. He is faithful, and he will never, never leave us. And you can take you, and he can take you through whatever it is. And when trials come and stay a while, always do the right thing. And seek strength and guidance from the Creator who loves you. And you know what? If you do those things, you'll find refuge in Him. Brethren, it's simply focusing on God and remembering that He will never, ever forsake us. But you know what? In order to have that hope and that joy, you have to be one of His children you've never been named his name and been buried in baptism think about the things that we've talked about today and today would be a great day to take and to confess his name to be buried in baptism and raised to walk in the newness of life but we also need to look at the things that we have looked at and talking about the trials because there's none of us sitting in this room today that has not experienced trials and hardships Things that we've even questioned, why, God, is this happening to me? 
but we also know if we put our faith and our trust in him, it will turn out for good and make us stronger. But how sad it would be if we've turned back into the world and we're not relying upon him and keeping our focus on him. He is willing to forgive. All we have to do is to ask for his forgiveness and then try to strive to live a Christian life. If you have need of the gospel invitation, won't you come while together we stand and sing? Calling for you.